my message today is uh, not going to be very Lent-ish. Today is more about God at work in the world in general. The gospel we had today was the transfiguration. So that's where Jesus becomes dazzling, glowing light with divine majesty. And uh, it's a little odd. There are only three people that witness this. Peter, James, and John. Now, part of what we're supposed to get from this story is that God is quiet and subtle most of the time. <laughs> most of the time, God just pushes us hard enough to get us moving under our own power. And the reason for that is God wants us to know him and and recognize him and, and labor for him. God doesn't want to literally do all the work. He wants us to make the connections. You know, to choose to be holy and praise him. So, if you're waiting for a big booming voice in the sky to ha to, for God to tell you what you are supposed to do in life, well, I'm sorry, but you have somewhat missed the point. And I say that knowing that people do get booming voices in the sky from time to time. St. Paul got that on the road to Damascus. But that's exceptional. For most of us, God doesn't slap us across the face with divine majesty. He taps us on the shoulder to get us to pay attention. Um, you know, we can forget so easily. You know, people will experience childhood traumas and completely repress those memories. You know, which will cause great secondary damage years or decades later because they're still working on something subconsciously, but consciously they don't know what's going on so they can't resolve the problem. It's very sad. And people will witness miraculous occurrences and be amazed for a day. And then by the end of the week, they'll have forgotten all about it. And plenty of people out there, plenty of us right here, right now, have, have, have made an oath to ourselves that we will never make that mistake that our parents made when we were growing up. And then we make up that mistake when we're parents ourselves. It happens, it happens. How quickly we forget what is most important in life. And the takeaway on all of that is that we need to pay attention to the world around us. Amazing, miraculous, life-changing things happen to us and around us all the time, but God will not force us to pay attention. It is up to us to see God at work in the world. And I've got a few examples of how that, how that looks in real life. So one friend of mine, he, uh, he worries about money a lot, even today, I think. Uh, he owns his own business, so I think it's kind of reasonable that he worries about money. Um, at the time of the story, I'd say he's probably in his late 20s, you know, just starting off his family and all that. So as the story goes, he was in church with his family, worrying about money, not even paying attention to the Mass, just worrying about money. So Mass ends. They leave, they leave to head out of church and go back to the parking lot. And some random old guy walks right up to him and gives him $100. And of course, my friend is like, uh, uh, what's this for? You know, he's just completely shocked. And the, and the, the random old man just said, eh, you look concerned. You got a good family. God bless you. And of course, my friend was just flabbergasted by all of this. And wouldn't you know it, next week at church, he made a promise to himself and to God that he'd lighten up a little bit with his worries about money. And mind you, his money troubles were way more than $100. All right? It's not like the problem went away, but he took that as a sign from God that maybe everything will be all right somehow. Something unusual happened to him and he was paying attention enough to see God tapping him on the shoulder 
just hard enough for him to pay attention. So when that friend finished that story, uh, another friend around the table shared a story of his own. So this guy had a brother, and the brother lived out of state. Now, this brother had a genetic disposition to some weird disease, I don't know what. Uh, but they tested negative for it back in childhood, so nobody was worrying about it. So, um, randomly, for no reason, he decides he wants to come to Wisconsin and visit family. It wasn't Thanksgiving or Christmas or anything, he just wanted to see family. So he comes up, and during that trip, he meets the woman who will later become his wife. They get married, and um, they, they need to stay in Wisconsin because she had a really good job with a hospital in the area. Uh, so they end up settling in Wisconsin, and apparently this is like the only way this guy would ever live in Wisconsin. But he loved her that much. My sister says something similar about living in Wisconsin. Nobody wants to live in Wisconsin. You live in Wisconsin because you love your family. Say, so I like living in Wisconsin. My sister doesn't take that. She, it's my sister, whatever. Anyway, so they're living in Wisconsin, and she works at a hospital, and as luck would have it, this hospital had a doctor that specialized in this weird disease that he might develop later in life. So because they lived close to the hospital and because she knew the doctor and all of this, they brought him in at cost for some just-to-be-safe tests. Kind of like a gift from the hospital to this, this couple because of the work that she did there. So he goes and does these tests and they discover some kind of, I don't know, like, like aneurysm waiting to happen somewhere in his chest. Again, I don't really know the medical details here. You've got to follow the story anyway. But they found something pretty serious in his chest. And they're like, oh, we better take care of that. They whip him off to the, uh, the operating room. They take care of him. They remove the aneurysm waiting to happen thingy. And everything's fine. But during the recovery, the doctors came up and said, you know, if we didn't do those tests, there's no way anybody ever would have realized that was there. And that was probably going to kill you in about three days. Three days. I want you to imagine just how amazing that is. Normally a coincidence involves two things. This is like five things all happening in sequence to allow this guy to survive this. And you know what his reaction to all that is? Huh. That was a nice coincidence. Lucky me. And his whole family is actually pretty religious. So everybody in his life are like, are you crazy? Like, how are you not seeing that as a sign? Why are you not in church every Sunday for the rest of your life? <laughs> but that's the way it goes. You know, even if God will save your life through a series of fortunate events, God will not force you to acknowledge him or even say thank you. This brother of my friend, you know, he's just the kind of guy that can't really see God working in his life. And for people like that, there's not really much we can do except hold them in prayer that the Holy Spirit will one day move them in a different direction. And I'll wrap up with one more, one more real-world example. My, uh, another friend of mine, uh, we graduated high school together. I went to college. He joined the military just in time for the invasion of Iraq. He went. You know, he saw action, full tour of duty and all that. And uh, when he left, he had no intention of, of practicing his faith at all. But when he came back, eh, 2005, 2006, somewhere around there, uh, when I saw him again, he said, you know, Justin, when I was overseas, I should have been killed 11 times. I escaped death 11 times, and not from my own ability. I'm done ignoring God. And today, he's one of my most faithful Catholic friends. So, I guess what I'm getting down to is, you know, God works with us with ultimate patience and divine love. So with that in mind, I just want to return to the transfiguration again. It is so odd that Peter, James, and John didn't realize who Jesus was even after this. 
You know, when the crucifixion comes around, James and John are nowhere to be found. Peter, re you know, denies him three times, as you guys all know. Why? Why didn't they remember Jesus brimming with divine majesty? And the answer is because the, the transfiguration is more subtle than we give it credit for. It is not a slap in the face like it kind of reads. It's more of a tap on the shoulder. It's a moment of divine revelation. It is a glimpse into Christ's true reality. And when that moment came and went, the disciples, those three guys, went right back to their ordinary lives. They didn't completely forget what happened on the mountain that day, but they wouldn't really understand. They wouldn't really see God at work in that moment until the Holy Spirit descends upon them on Pentecost Sunday. They get there in the end, but they needed a little time. Now for us, we have the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit descends upon us upon our baptism. So all we need to do is pay attention and be willing to see God at work in the world and in our lives for the salvation of everyone and everything.